Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, pleased to be here for the, the second year. This is a, a, great, uh, a great venue, um, and I am very pleased to see that uh, wood frame construction, wood frame houses are, are finally getting some attention from the, the research community. They've always been sort of the, 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 the ugly stepchild. Of course, we've been building houses for thousands of years, uh, all without the benefit of engineers. Um, and engineers have primarily focused on you know, the, the, the big things, the bridges, the skyscrapers, things of that sort. But uh, I think for any of you, those of you who have ever tried to analyze a wood frame structure, you know that they are by far and away some of the most complicated structures we have to deal with. So it's, it's exciting to see so much brain power being uh, put into this, uh, this endeavor. Uh, pleased to host this uh, panel or chair this panel. Um, purpose of this panel is to give you just a little bit of tease about four great technology products. Every one of these topics, every one of these speakers could, could use a whole hour just talking about their, their tool, uh, which are, are really some pretty cool uh, things that we have available. Uh, but the purpose here is just uh, for them to say enough to tease you and spark some discussion about how we can move these things forward. Uh, and I, I'd like to, I, I'm a visual person. It makes sense, I'm in engineering. Um, so I want to start out with a, a visual statement of the problem, okay? This, this is it. Now what do we have here? Tools. Uh, is this a beautiful set of tools or what? <laughs> okay, one of the most impressive set of tools I've ever seen. Lovely tools, brass, hardwood, steel. What's wrong with this? You never use it. <laughs> They're not being used. They're just sitting in the toolbox. Right now this is just artwork. Tools are meant to be used, and that's the, 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 the theme of, of today's discussion, is, is how do we take these, these lovely tools that the four panel members will talk about and make sure that they're used. Tools are meant to be used and, and worn out, um, and that's, that's really the, the challenge here. So to, to put that in words for, for those of you in the, in the non-engineering sciences, um, how, how do we promote and, and whom do we promote existing tools and services for assessing and grading a building's, I want to insert, I'm going to do an edit here, expected performance uh, in an earthquake. And purpose of this is, is to get, get these tools out to the stakeholders. Uh, you, you heard Glenn talk about the, the different deductibles and different uh, 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 options that one could get with the CEA policy. How does a homeowner know to, how to choose between those options? Part of that depends on understanding the vulnerability of the building. How does Janiel know which uh, types of vulnerabilities the CEA is going to fund in their mitigation discount? That goes back to, to understanding the expected performance. So that's, that's where we are. Um, so I'm, uh, each, each of the speakers has, has between five and a maximum of ten minutes to to talk about their thing. I'm going to be rather brutal in cutting them off because I want to make sure that there is plenty of time to solicit thoughts and suggestions from the audience of how we further the, the penetration of, of these tools into the marketplace for the ultimate benefit of making California, can I use the word resilient? Yes. Or resilient in the future. So uh, we're going to start out with uh, Kurt is going to be talking about uh, SP3 and uh, a derivative of ATC58. Yep. So. Cool. Thank you, John. Thanks. Appreciate it. OK. Make sure that's working. OK. OK, can you hear me OK? OK, make sure this is working. OK, well, I'm excited to talk about the, uh, what I've been spending my life on for probably the last four years, pretty much, right? and what a lot of people before have been spending their life on researching for the probably 25 years before that to develop the methods that we use. Um, and that's the seismic performance prediction program um, that we have created and that's being used um, for lots of different purposes um, in our profession now. So I'm going to stay out of the technical detail, right? If you go to our website, hpurisk.com, we've got webinars until your heart's content, so you can get into the technical detail, but that's not the point of today. I do want to give a quick overview, though, of the method that is underlying all this, right? And that's the FEMA P58 method. Um, it was developed by FEMA and the Applied Technology Council, which you know are in the room over a 15-year period. 
And that also leveraged research from probably the past a decade or two before that, right, in a lot of the databases and things that they've used. So the basic process connects all the dots of what's important for risk to a building, right? What's the ground motion? How does the building respond to that ground motion? Right? How did the fragile components in the building, both structural and non-structural, get damaged? Aggregate that all together and get risk curves, vulnerability curves. Okay, so the outcome of this process is how much do I lose in terms of money, repair cost, and then also what might my repair time be right after the earthquake. And you can look at it in lots of different ways, right? You know, ground motion levels and so on, but that's the basic outcomes. The basic FEMA P58 process does this for a fixed base structure typically. So the current peer CEA project that Janiel mentioned is looking at how these curves might change when you have a foundation instability like the cripple walls, right? And modifying how these curves would look to, to account for that. Um, and the SP3 software is being used by the Stanford research team in doing those assessments. So I wanna talk about two use cases. The first use case I wanna talk about is an engineering evaluation. Okay, where it's a single building, you go in, you have an engineer, they do a detailed evaluation. Um, and when they do that, they start with detailed information about the building, right? They know what's actually in the building. For wood light frame, that would mean they, they go in and they actually know about the structure, walls, finishes, all those things. And then they use that information in what we're calling our SP3 engineering tool. Okay, and in this process, a licensed engineer is at the helm, right? And it requires engineering judgment as you go through the process. Okay, so this is a more detailed evaluation, right? And, um, you know, necessarily, you know, takes more time and expense like you were sort of alluding to, um, which for wood light frame is a problem. This is being used for wood light frame buildings, but it's typically more for like the new five story buildings and things like that. Um, it, but it is being used for um, low rise buildings, particularly um, up in Oregon, they're trying to look at sort of resilient retrofit and things like that. So it is being used on, on even single family dwellings. Uh, it goes through a web interface, right? So you can go on and, and run the stuff on here on our servers, right? So that it's fast and doesn't take up the computational stuff on your computer. Okay, so that's use case one, that's engineering evaluation. Use case two, is in response to a lot of prospective clients that have approached us and said, we really want this good FEMA P50 at risk information, but we want it for a portfolio. I might want it for a thousand or a hundred thousand buildings, okay? And when I do those types of evaluations, I'm, I, there's no way, I never would and, and never will um, have an engineering evaluation for each property, I can't do that. So over the past about two years or so, we've developed a method by which you can leverage the FEMA P58 process using basic building information, right, or additional building information. So for wood, you know, year of construction, height of the building, location of the building, things like that. You might also know square footage, beds and baths, you know, type of roof, chimneys, and so on. And we've created a process that we call the SP3 Building Specific Risk Model so that you can connect the dots using the P58 framework to go from that basic information to an estimate of your building specific vulnerability curve. Now, this is an approximate, obviously, right? Because it's not a full engineering evaluation. So there's gonna be more uncertainty in this process, but you can get estimates of those vulnerability curves. So if you look at what's inside this, I can't go into the detail, right? You go to our website and watch the one hour webinar on this if you wanna know the detail. But basically what we've done is we've created a bunch of databases and engines, right? That run the P58 process based on what information you give us. Okay, so if you have a wood light frame building and you know location, this and that, beds, baths, roof type and so on, what we'll do is we'll create an archetype model of your building We'll design that building using the code that dictates the design for both seismic and wind at the site that the building's at, right? Make effectively a model of your building and then use that to predict the responses of your building and the downstream damage of your building. So it does it on a site specific and building specific basis, right? But does it, you know, more quickly in an automated fashion. Okay, so how can we use this to assess the risk for a large portfolio? We first start with inventory, right? This might be CEA insured inventory. It might be a different inventory. We need to know what's there. For some properties, we have basic information. For some properties, we might have more information. So we might be able to utilize the secondary modifiers. Then we need building specific and site specific curves for each property, right? So I show three, but it can be 
lots. And you can run that using the risk model in a batch processing service that we've created. So as I've gotten into this, I've been amazed at what smart programmers can do with Amazon Web Services, which wasn't possible five plus years ago. Literally to do this, you can go through and we spin up a thousand processors on Amazon. And for one of our big clients, um, recently we actually have run all of the buildings in California, both residential and commercial for a database that they have. So there's things that you can do now that are crazy in my mind, but you can do them with a lot of the technologies that are available today. So then you have curves for each building, right? So in California, that's 13 million. That's how many we ran. So then you can roll that into a portfolio risk assessment, right? That can be done with vendor model technology. That can be done with groups like ImageCat. And thank you, Bill, for some of the, the graphics today. Um, so you can roll it all together into the portfolio assessment. And then at the end, you get a portfolio loss versus ground motion. You can do with and without retrofit strategies. If you want to try and change your portfolio, you can slice and dice all those statistics in lots of different ways. So I don't want to get into the detail of all that, right? But the big picture outcomes of this process for use case two, which is leveraging uh, SP3 for a, a portfolio or inventory evaluation, is that this process allows you to use the transparent and public domain methods from the past 25 years, right? Developed by peer and then aggregated into P58 um, in the ATC and FEMA projects and, and get the results on an approximate basis, not a full engineering specific basis, but an approximate basis um, for an inventory for a portfolio um, in the format that people typically uh, need it for, for that type of analysis. This process provides better risk information than just curves by class. Thank you. Um, and leverage you know, building specific, insight specific things. So you can use this improved knowledge to compare to other vendor models and so on. And there's lots of different uses for this. So current uses of SP3, um, I have one minute, so I will be fast. Uh, building specific resiliency assessments being used for retrofit, new design, insurance underwriting and acquisitions. And then I mentioned the large inventory assessments. John asked us to talk about impediments to broader use. There's primarily two. I would say the first one's awareness, right? Especially of the portfolio and batch stuff, which we um, released last year. And then also there's still a perception of this being a Cadillac method and hard to use, right? Even on the engineering side. And with all the automation, it's actually very quick to use. Even for a full engineering evaluation, you know, you're, you're talking a couple hours once the engineer is trained. Um, for an initial evaluation. So some of the key benefits, building specific, the key benefits of P58, comprehensive, credible, transparent, open source, and then SP3, the role there is just to make FEMA P58 usable and fast. Um, so questions, how can we basically use this to provide better information, encourage more resilient buildings, both new buildings and retrofit with a focus specifically on wood light frame. And I want to respect the 10 minutes, so thank you very much. All right. Perfect. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, now at the uh, uh, next speaker is uh, sort of the, the opposite end of, of the spectrum, the, the practical application of uh, one of the, uh, I guess I'd, I'd characterize it as an earlier uh, incarnation of, of building assessment uh, which was really focused on uh, single family uh, wood homes, uh, a FEMA P50, which has been, what, 10 years in the making? Uh, around a long time. But um, a Skip Walker is gonna talk about some of his, uh, his experiences with actually uh, implementing this uh, and applying this in the field. Skip, thank you. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just a home inspector. <laughs> and with all the, brown, uh, the brain power in this room, kind of in here. I guess the, the reality is I'm the boots on the ground and, and my colleagues are the boots on the ground. P50, and I'm, I'm assuming you guys know what it is, we look at it as really a tool um, to give a homeowner a couple things, one of which is kind of where am I at with my house today? Um, and it allows a, a layperson, essentially, not an engineer, not even a contractor necessarily, but somebody that's got a moderate amount of training to go in and assess the, the house and come back with, with a, a score. So a lot like the water heater has a little yellow sticker on it that says 
this is going to use this much uh, energy relation in relation to other water heaters. Um, the P50 gives us a score that says this house is going to perform relative to other homes in about this manner. Um, every house starts out with 100 points and you work your way down. But the, but the important part is at the end, we, we give the homeowner um, a sense for, for what they actually can expect post-event. We also give them, I think, a really important piece of information. We give them some information on what they can do to make that less bad. P50 is not intended, and the, and the outcomes that come from P50 aren't intended to avoid all damage to a property. Their, their real intent is to make sure that we keep people, if they, if they follow the recommendations, that we keep people out of high school gymnasiums after the event or not sleeping on their lawn after the event. That's the goal, I think, of, as I see it with P50, is to help um, help people be able to occupy the house or continue to occupy the house after the proverbial big one hits. Um, let's see here. We got, oh, there we go. Um, P50 really kind of targets the low hanging fruit. It's, it, uh, it really is kind of a, uh, like the prescriptive retrofits. It's a kind of almost a prescriptive analysis, it, it's a cookbook. Um, if you don't, have never seen it, I actually brought a few copies of the hard copy form. It's an older version. We're actually working off tablets at this point uh, using a, a web interface. Um, but the important part is we give the homeowner some actionable information. That's, I think, the, the real important part. Um, we want to we wanna make sure that as many of these houses are occupiable after the event as is humanly possible. That's obviously not going to be the case in, 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 all, uh, in all cases. This afternoon, like I said, I'm a home inspector. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, I'm going to downtown San Francisco, and I'm going to inspect an 1889 home that's two stories over a garage. Um, so the likelihood is, I mean, what could possibly go wrong in an earthquake with a house like that, right? Um, so uh, the likelihood is that's going to be a soft first story with a brick foundation and what's a bolt. Um, those people, it, it, that, that's a tough conversation to have with people because the house, if I, when I looked at it last night, it's been all tricked out. It's got the beautiful kitchen. It's got the fancy bathrooms. Um, I can almost guarantee you they spent zero on actually making that house survive an earthquake. Um, that's a conversation that I'm going to have with those people, though. Um, so anyway, um, the, the tool itself has some very, some fairly tight constraints. Um, you know, it's simple wood frame structures. We're not doing any split levels, no, uh, no nothing else. The, um, uh, the idea, though, is to allow somebody that's not a registered design professional uh, and actually not even a contractor to go in after a little bit of training and actually give a fairly consistent uh, from house to house um, uh, assessment of that house. Um, the biggest problem that we see right now is that, um, uh, that we're not getting uh, uh, asked to actually perform these assessments. So, um, but the, the P50 tool and the training actually do allow us to kind of broaden the assessor pool. We've got 13, 14 million homes in, in California. There just aren't enough engineers, and actually, frankly, there aren't enough contractors to go out and assess even 10% even of those houses. If you did that, uh, it would take an inordinate amount of, of resources. So what, what has happened is California, Real Estate, uh, California uh, uh, Earthquake Authority actually has reached out through Mary Ann and her, her good work um, to the California Real Estate Inspection Association that I belong to. And we have an additional you know, seven, 800 sets of boots on the ground. We've tried to train and in the process actually of training um, as many of those folks as we can, every one of those inspectors, people like me, are gonna see one to two houses a day. Those are opportunities maybe not to do a P50 full on assessment, but I can tell you that knowing what I know now uh, after having gone through um, uh, uh, the, the P50 training, 
it, it changes the color of my inspections because I know what the impact of those cripple walls are in terms of post post uh, disaster um, uh, consequences. So anyway, bringing in the home inspectors I think is really important. The biggest the biggest barrier at this point, frankly, and I'm and time's kind of limited. The biggest barrier, that, frankly, at this point is we're seeing those houses at the point at which usually they're being bought and sold. So there's there's folks involved in that. Uh, agents that really have no vested interest in more information that could cloud the sale uh, getting brought into the mix. So there's a real awareness and education process I think that has to take place uh, from my perspective with the real estate community uh, so that they understand the value of this and don't see it as a threat but an opportunity. Um, I just had uh, uh, an opportunity to listen to somebody from the National Association of Realtors speak at our um, ASHI, the National Organization Conference in, in Florida, and um, she was talking about a different topic, Department of Energy Home Score, uh, uh, which basically does sort of like P50, but for energy performance and cons conservation. And, and I can tell you she had really nothing good to say about it because she saw that information is, is changing the, the perception in the market of one house over another. Um, so there's clearly some education that has to take place in, in that end of it if, if we're really gonna get some traction on this. And I think at the end of the day, we, we must get traction on this because we can't all be living in the local high school gymnasium after the big one hits. In my area, every house is a high-risk house for all intents and purposes. Everything is post-World War II. Everything has very, very minimal bolting, it's, if, if in fact it has any kind of systematic bolting at all. Every house has cripple walls for all intents and purposes, or it's a soft first story. Uh, and it seems like I'm on a rash of, of lately of homes that are brick foundations a whole different set of problems. And P50 really doesn't apply to that because it, it's, it's an exception. That would have to be an engineered solution. Um, so anyway, we're gonna get going here. Just really quick, that's sort of what the tool looks like. It breaks the house down into the basically the things that I can deal with and the things I can't deal with. I can't change where that house is. I can't change the seismicity of the soil. I can't change the fact that it's on, uh, it's on bay fill, but I can change the fact that maybe it's, it's not bolted to current standards. I can change the fact that the, um, uh, the cripple walls don't have plywood on the interior face of them, but they could. Um, and then lastly, I would say, uh, I would say to you guys, um, there's a couple opportunities I think that I see. I know you guys, a lot of you do research. Um, look at the home inspector group and Marianne can hook you up with this as a way to get information. Um, this happens at the national level a lot. ASHI, the American Society of Home Inspectors, gets contacted by, just recently, by Weyerhaeuser. And Weyerhaeuser had a problem with some, some, uh, some of their engineered wood products. So they reached out to ASHI and Guess what? We've got inspectors that actually go and visit the sites. They'll give us an address and we'll go look at something and actually they'll give us a little checklist. That kind of stuff is possible. Um, so if you've got information gathering needs, um, utilize the resources you've got, which is your partners and the home inspection organizations in the state. I think, uh, I think you would find that valuable. Um, and then uh, uh, I, I really think we've got some education to do with the building departments as well. Um, I, know, I know there's the, the, uh, uh, the perception in my mind is that, that, uh, that, that um, uh, the inspectors actually go out and look at this stuff. In reality, uh, my experience has been that when somebody submits a voluntary retrofit set of plans for permitting, um, that it gets rubber stamped as long as they don't think it's gonna damage the structure. Uh, we see a lot, of, a lot of retrofits that I would categorize as decorative. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the home inspectors, um, I think if you talk to, them, to us, you'll, you'll, you'll probably hear um, and Thor, you, know, you could probably speak to this as well, probably one in four retrofits are actually done really well. Um, that means three out of four are lacking in some, you know, they've been 
overdriven nails. They didn't, they didn't nail around the perimeter of the, of the cripple walls completely, whatever the problem was. But those retrofits are not going to perform as well as they could have had somebody actually taken a few more minutes. So anyway, I know I'm, I'm over, um, and thank you. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Skip, th th thank you very much. I, ha I have to take strong exception with one of your comments. So you introduced yourself as just a home inspector, okay? You, that, the, the home inspectors are a critical part of, of this, this whole process. And I think what's, what's really exciting about, about this meeting is that we have people across the entire spectrum of, of, of the problem. You know, most of the conferences we go to, it's a bunch of like-minded engineers who've all gone to the same schools and had the same advisors, and we all do the same textbooks, and we get together and we talk about, you know, minutia down in the fourth or fifth decimal point. But this is, this is really, this conference is really looking at, at, the, at the big issues. How do we get these really cool tools that, 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 you know, us engineers sitting in ivory towers someplace develop, how do we actually get them out into the world so they can actually do some good? So. Anyway, thank you very much. Your, your comments are, are, are very helpful, and I, I think you know, we, we need to uh, do, do a better job of, of, of bridging the gap between theory on one end and the actual practical implication on, on the other. Um, and the next speaker needs no introduction, because you already know who she is. So. She's back. She's back. OK. Awesome, thanks. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, Ditto with the, the home inspectors. I mean, we just don't have the ability to communicate, to interact with homeowners. It's like most of us have a doctor, at least see a doctor every once in a while. Um, you know, not a lot of people have a, a structural engineer. And so the opportunities that we have to interact are so important. And so what we have done with um, QuakeGrade is really to just try and create a tool that facilitates exactly what you described. So thank you so much. So I won't go into a lot about what it's doing. It's really, same slides I used last year, but rather what our, our approach is here. And so, um, there we go, giant green button. Wanted to go back though just a little bit, and, and I noticed Fred's in the room too, and so afterwards, Fred, if I say anything wrong, you can absolutely step in. The Homeowner's Guide for uh, Earthquake Safety is required by state law to be delivered to a buyer of a pre-1960 house by the seller. Um, California state law requires you to provide a geological hazard disclosure of fault, rupture, landslide, liquefaction for every house. Um, but the, and the homeowner's guide only to pre-1960. Now sellers of these houses though can check, I don't know, in terms of vulnerabilities. And I believe the language says they need to have actual knowledge. That's the, the legal language. So you could have no sill plate anchorage and you could have no plywood around your crawl space and you could check, I don't know. And um, frankly, I think that these are all being delivered to folks during escrow. I don't know if, if last time you bought a house, there's a stack of paper, they tell you what it is, you sign it, you give it back to them. And, you know, so there's not a lot of kind of um, pre-sale information involving this, this kind of stuff. And here's this amazing tool that ATC and, and FEMA created. We had a little bit of financial input on the development, and um, Sean and I had the privilege of sitting in on some of the development meetings. And so the idea here is that we wanted to digitize it to make it available and to make it as easy as possible because, you know, there's some looking up of, of stuff. And so how can we make this easy? So we developed QuakeGrade. QuakeGrade is doing exactly what Skip said. It's, it's creating a seismic performance grade. You do the location first, and so you know if you live near a, a fault, you might immediately go from an A to a B minus just because of where you are. And um, if you're not going to move that house, that's about as high as you're going to get. Uh, you figure out a seismic hazard score using um, Cal OES or CGS information. And the cool thing now is that this is done automatically in Quake Grade. We had 49 houses that we did in the Napa um, uh, research project. We had home inspectors go out and use. Uh, FEMA P50, we found this was the area that they had the most difficulty getting the information off the website and putting it in. So now this is all done immediately. That seismic hazard score is automatic. And so it answers if you're in a liquefaction, landslide, fault rupture zone, what the um, uh, SDC value is, or SDS, I can't remember which one. Sorry. Um, and then structural score is where we really rely on the home inspector. And we're having a little bit of an issue with their liability insurance because there are insurance companies who are saying, 
saying that they're doing uh, actual structural engineering. And what we're trying to, to say is no, they're not. They're making observations. And the engineering has been done by the developers of the tool. And so we do have insurance companies who recognize that. So the idea here is to, to try and make that normalized within the community. Characteristics of the house, as Skip mentioned, are their observations. You know, what size bolt? How often do you apply wood? How, what thick, how thickness? What are the nailing? And then you come up with, and then very important, is you give the homeowner tools to rectify or mitigate those vulnerabilities, and it shows them how they can improve the, the score. So you can go from a C minus with that unretrofitted house to perhaps back up to that B minus because of where you live. So Quake Grade can be used on any of the devices. Um, I think the actual word is it's an interactive web tool. It is exactly FEMA P50. We haven't changed that. We just kind of use the TurboTax model in that you start with an A so that, so that a home inspector and someone who's using it can see when something changes the grade significantly. So you have a sense for what the big ticket items are. We are, in fact, working with ATC and with Kelly Cobain and CREA to train. And the exciting thing is that CREA is going to take over that training for their own members and create a Certifi certification. And so they're really excited and working hard to implement this. And uh, we really think it's a great opportunity. Thank you. All right, Janelle, thank you very much. And then last but not least, Evan Reese is going to be uh, talking about the U.S. Resiliency Council and their rating system. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I thank John for letting me go last, because what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes is how all of the great conversations and presentations that you've heard can be integrated into something that, that we hope will be a, a, a tool going forward. Um, uh, I'm not going to go over a background history of the U.S. Resiliency Council. You can check us out at uh, usrc.org. We're a nonprofit. Uh, and we are founded with a mission that is twofold. Uh, the first part is to educate building stakeholders about the performance of buildings in earthquakes and other natural hazards, uh, and to uh, promote the concept that uh, resilience can be obtained or, or can be improved through better design of buildings, what that costs, what you're getting from existing buildings, that kind of thing. Uh, we were started in 2011, and our, our focus has been primarily on uh, commercial buildings, uh, initially, originally, and currently in earthquakes. Uh, but as soon as we started uh, the USRC, I had conversations with Janiel, and her first question was naturally, are you going to extend this to residential uh, properties as well? And we've always had that goal in mind of doing that. But ironically, back in 2011, it was probably easier to evaluate a commercial property, a, a, a regular concrete frame or, 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 or shear wall or, or steel building, than it was a, a house with all these different components to it. But that's changed based on the work that has been done um, by these folks that have talked to you today and others. And so that's what I want to kind of present is our vision for uh, extending the kind of resilience rating system into the residential uh, 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 sector and providing more detailed information on how buildings perform. Janiel has already sort of talked about this, uh, the disclosure forms. Uh, you get a stack of them. Sometimes you get them when you make the offer on the house. Sometimes you get them in escrow. And I just took you know, sort of a couple of points from several of the disclosure forms. Uh, they require uh, a disclosure of any obvious damage that has occurred to the house based on you know, drainage, water, or earthquake. Uh, and then there are there are uh, items that, that relate to the potential for damage in some sort of event, like being next to a military training facility, I guess, or, or ghosts with uh, people that have died in the property. So, uh, but the, the earthquake part of this, as Janiel has said, is really relegated to this primary checklist. This is just a section of it that I could fit on the screen, which asks you these nine questions about you know, are, is there any evidence of this in your house? And I bought five houses in California over my life, and every single one of them, every single check mark was don't know. And in fact, a couple of them, there was just a line that went right down <laughs> over don't know. So 
the effectiveness of this checklist, well, at least in my experience, has been zero for five right now. Me as a structural engineer, I've sold two houses, and so I fill these out diligently because I know that I'm actually liable if I don't fill that out, because believe me, I've been under every house that I've, that I've bought. Um, so our thought is how can we improve this system? How can we take the technical work that has been done to date to improve the ability to uh, assess the performance of wood frame houses and extend that into this sort of real estate disclosure uh, community resilience process. And so I've got this little uh, image here which really actually talks about everything that we've mentioned today. We go from the home inspection to P50, which is essentially you know, what quake grade is, giving you this grade on this house of A to D, that grade, though, is based on uh, generally sort of an expert opinion basis of, of what's positive and negative for houses based on their, their, their characteristics. And the range of performance that you can expect is very broad. You'll see that the P50 grade doesn't actually talk about safety, and it talks very generally about recovery time and very broadly about damage from 20 to 80% or 20 to 100%, that kind of thing. But the work that we've been doing, the, with that, that Yusuf uh, and his team have been doing on the PEER project uh, to look at cripple wall bracing, the ATC 110 project in terms of retrofit, uh, we've now started to develop lots of computer models that can simulate the actual deficiencies or characteristics of the building that you would find in a P50 evaluation. And then the work that Kurt talked about in marrying those evaluations with the fragility information developed out of FEMA P58 that he's used in SP3 can now start to estimate actual damage and recovery time to a better degree than what we currently have with P50. And then there's work by others, uh, like the USRC, like, like Ross Stein at Tembler, um, who have been looking at how to graphically represent and map and display this kind of information so that homeowners or, or cities or others can use that data. And so this is where we would like to envision um, taking all of this information and moving forward to develop a more refined rating system that goes from something like P50 that extends it based on the kind of analysis that's being done um, to, to get better quantification of performance of, of houses in earthquakes. Uh, where can this be used? Well, we see it being used as on three in three areas. The first area is part of this disclosure form, right? Eventually, if a requirement for P50 is embedded into the home inspection process. In, in 2017, the home, there's actually a section in the code in California that says exactly what a home inspection has to have. And in 2017, it was amended to require that any home inspector that does an inspection where there's a pool or a spa has to uh, check for these seven safety categories. And so, you know, it's possible to update these home inspection requirements so that they include things like a, a FEMA P50 Evaluation. And it's great to see that CREA is focusing on training its members to, to understand P50 because that will contribute to that, that ability. So we see that as part of the disclosure process. We see this better quantification of damage as something that will improve the whole insurance side of things and lending side of things to look at the risk. But then we also see a community aspect of this. As this information over time grows and cities start to accumulate or we start to accumulate data on the, the grades or the performance of houses, you can start to aggregate that information and look at it on a city by city basis. So a city can now start to understand what are its shelter needs gonna be? How many people are likely to be in the gym, right? Versus how many people are, are able to shelter in place. Uh, and it can also be used for post earthquake immediate response planning. So if, if, a, if the database of housing information grows and over over time is, is put into a, an accessible database, shake maps can be overlaid on that. Uh, and, and with that, you can start to estimate where the impacts are gonna be. And we've had some preliminary discussions with some of the large retail, you know, big box retailers, uh, whom you all know, about how to, um, 
take that information and quickly understand the kinds of needs for the community, how much plywood is going to be needed to do repairs, how many you know, supplies and toilet paper and things like that are going to be needed for, for people that are just trying to kind of hunker down. So we see this ability to take all the work that's currently being done and, and integrate it together into something that can serve homeowners, insurance companies, wider communities. Uh, and so we're going to be asking CEA to fund some of that. And yes, Janiel has given us the ground rules earlier this morning, and that's fine. Um, but this is something that I think we have all this great information, much of it already funded in part by CEA. And we'd like to see that extended to something that now can be made usable on the broad, broad scale. So that's, that's it. OK. Yep. Yep. Presentations um, and entertainment is, is a big part of what we have to do. Thank you. Um, uh, what, what I think is, is uh, really exciting about what we're going to be talking about today is, is bringing all the pieces together. That uh, if if uh, uh, one of the one of the calls we or several of the calls we received immediately after the Northridge earthquake were from. Uh, anonymous representatives of building owners in Northern California who had steel frame buildings. And, and, and they, they called up and they said, um, do you think there's a chance that, that, that uh, a, a building in San Francisco built in the last 10 years has cracks in their welds? We said, yes. So is there, is there any, and this was be, before the, uh, the, 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 what was the big, the big report came out on it, but they said, is, is, is there any requirement that we inspect these? No. Is, is there any generally accepted uh, repair methodology? We said no. They said, OK, thank you very much. We don't want to know. <laughs> in, in other words, we, we don't want to do the inspection. We don't want to find out about a vulnerability for which there is no known cure. But what we have been talking about here is we've, you know, we, we have the tools to assess and identify these vulnerabilities. And later this afternoon, we'll be hearing about methods to mitigate these. So we, we, we're trying to bring the earthquake risk more un, into the, the realm of the termite inspectors, where you know, everybody expects that you're going to have a termite inspection and there's going to be some repairs associated with it. The realtors aren't too concerned about that because it's generally predictable. It's, it's going to be a few thousand dollars, and it's not going to hold up the sale. And so part of the challenge is, is getting the, the earthquake vulnerabilities into that, that same, same mindset. Um, with that, I'm going to open this up for uh, discussion and, again, remind you of our topic. You know, how, how can we get these tools in use? How can we, how can we take these, these fancy tools out of the toolbox and, and get them into widespread uh, common use? Um, and someplace we've got wandering microphones. Okay. Um, so I would like to solicit your comments, your suggestions, your thoughts, your experiences. What are, what are the challenges to getting these tools into more widespread use, and, and what can we do to, uh, to facilitate that? Thank you. So I have a question for Kurt, who showed us an interesting application of what was a tool that was developed as a building-specific tool, yep. applying that to a portfolio type of assessment. So Kurt, I know you had limited time. Can you expand a little bit on the advantages of using that building-specific tool over other existing portfolio type um, methodologies that are out there now? Yeah, so you're saying the advantages of the using use case one instead of use case two? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, the advantages of using use case two over okay. other, other methodologies that are already operating in use case two. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so basically in, in use case two, the you know, inventory portfolio use case. So, you know, basically that's set up using the FEMA P58 framework. Right, so it connects all the dots, ground motion to structural response and all those things. So that process, albeit simplified, right, takes more into account about the building and site location than you would in just pulling a hazardous curve or something like that. Right, so in that process, let, let's take you know, a, a newer building. We would go and say, okay, what's the site location? 
what ground motion was that building designed for? Okay, let's make an archetype model of that building, both with appropriate strength and stiffness. Let's also check wind design. Was it controlled by wind? Okay, now how much strength and stiffness might, might it have there? So we make a building and site-specific representation of that building and then take that through the rest of the process. So it's still simplified, but it's not based on a building class. It takes into account all the building and site-specific properties. Now, for a wood light frame building, right, you know, those nuance, dif those differences are probably a little bit less important for a commercial building if you're looking at a one story. So if you look at like a commercial building built in San Francisco versus where I'm from in Chico, which is lower seismic of, of California, you know, the San Francisco building is much, you know, stiffer and stronger because the ground motions are higher. Now, the same is true for a wood light frame building. Right, but then all the non-structural stuff comes in. So the differences are a little bit less for wood buildings, um, but still important, right? And uh, for, for commercial buildings, they're much, much different, right, when you use that site-specific information. Yeah, did that answer your question? Okay, yeah. Use a Chert, uh, follow-up question. Suppose you run SP3 for portfolio, not single uh, mm -hmm. case. Yep. And suppose, Core logic does the same thing. How far these will be different? By factor of two, five, ten, ten percent? You're saying if core logic runs the portfolio assessment right. or? Uh, so the uh, professional loss modelers, yep. if they run portfolio for loss estimation and you do it also, uh, is there any comparison between your results versus others? Yeah, I, I haven't done that direct comparison. Usually they're pretty close to the vest on that kind of data, right? So it's not publicly available for us to compare to, right? So I haven't done that direct comparison. We've done comparisons to Hazus and things like that that are publicly available, um, you know, and, and that shows that, you know, the curves fit pretty well with Hazus where you'd expect them to, like 1980s one and two story wood buildings, you know, match fairly well for the stuff that we've done. Um, and then doesn't fit in other cases where Hazus doesn't do well, like a new five-story wood building. You know, we show much more risk for that building type than Hazus might predict. Yeah. I have a question for Janiel. Mm -hmm. Do you have any statistics on, on how many people have downloaded QuakeGrade and, and how it's being used? Marianne, do we? Um, no. no. next year we should actually have some numbers we can report. Yeah, but we will have the, the ability obviously to do that and um, also to collect some kind of basic information about um, building ratings, you know, get a, get a sense for what, what people are finding out there. Uh, yeah, so um, it's available quakegrade.com. She looks at me like, why don't you know any of this? <laughs> and you have to put in a, an engineering license, a contractor's license. It's that you have to be qualified. So the idea is that you would have to have been trained um, as a home inspector, or you could be a, a, a licensed contractor, a registered engineer, um, or a licensed architect as well. Right. It, it, there is a qualification that you do have to have. Um, you, you have to tie to the contractor right. state licensing board, actually. And we do a, a live cross check to make right. certain it is valid. Same thing with engineers' licenses. And then um, we also run against the CREA's membership because we are limiting it to the CCL and MML, which is master certified. Uh, or I. C CCI, CREA certified inspector, and master CREA inspector, MCI. Okay, and that's because of the level of education they have to achieve to get there. Right, and I want to clarify, the reason that we want a qualified people only to be inputting is that we're, we are collecting data, and so we do have another program that if any of you are interested in playing with it, we do, she, Marianne can give you access to it. We didn't want people to go in and use the real program and play with it, and we'd have all these fake you know, ratings on it. And so the idea is that, because we, we, we would like to have a sense for what houses are being rated. Yes. So I think you, you pointed to the right thing. We need to go and have this like a termite inspection. So how do we go to change that? I've had the same experience with only about two houses, but 
I don't know, I don't know, except all the water heaters strapped, but it was not right. And another house, they say it was bolted, but there was a, a screw every 12 feet. It was not bolted, right? But the inspectors, yeah, bolted. Yeah. So how do we go first removing that I don't know, and then having something that's mandatory? I mean, it's not, I don't, I don't want to impose more on homeowners. At the same time, it's their protection, and they don't know what they're buying. That's really distressing. So what's the next step? How do well, we get there? And the interesting thing is we have methods to mitigate these things, unlike the, yeah, the ghosts. Exactly. The ghosts, I don't know yeah, how to get rid of ghosts. No, <laughs> yes, uh, the ghosts are an issue. I found bones in my, in my crawl space too, but I, well, I won't address those. <laughs> So, and why I think this goes to a larger issue. There was some uh, off uh, off mic discussion this morning about legislation, and I don't know if anybody wants to volunteer comments about. Just, just that at this point, the CA is not promoting legislation, requiring or mandating anything for houses. <laughs> How's that for a little disclaimer there? Um, <laughs> if you want to talk to Janiel about that later, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I wanted to offer Fred. Would you like to weigh in here at all on your perspective? <laughs> Put you on the spot. Yeah, so Fred Turner from the Seismic Safety Commission, of course, is responsible for that homeowner's guide. So not from an advocacy standpoint, but maybe some history. Uh, the commission did sponsor legislation in the early 90s that required seismic retrofits of homes at the time of sale, but it was vetoed by the governor. So as a fallback, we went back and negotiated with the California Association of Realtors, who was really the uh, opponent to that, those efforts, and what resulted was the homeowner's guide to earthquake safety. In, in all fairness, that's still one of the most popular earthquake safety documents we have in, in California. So despite the fact that you're getting a lot of don't knows, yeah. nevertheless, there are owners and others who are reading it. So there is some transfer of information and people are basically buying homes uh, because it's a seller's market and uh, people are buying homes sight unseen and taking the risk because uh, we're not in a buyer's market. You don't really have a choice in most parts of California. Right, and Fred, I wanted to clarify that when, when you know, because I use that all the time and say, you, they can say I don't know. Um, it, it is a, a great document and it is something that is being delivered. It just could be so much more. So when I speak to it, it's really, it has so much more potential. Hi, um, just responding quickly to that. What I would say is that document has reach, but we don't know how much impact it has on decision making. So that's an opportunity. It, we know it has the reach. We're not sure about the influence, influentialness. Um, I have a ton of thoughts from the social science angle on everything that's been discussed. I'm so impressed, first of all, with just the, the comprehensiveness and the end-to-end the -end, uh, success that you're having in the research program, seeing all the parts and how they have to fit together. So good job on that. Um, I have bought a house in the last year and a half, and someone in the room has been around it who knows how bad it is. And the... I, I want to point out that it is actually, along your lines of the theme of the conference, it's e-delivery and e-disclosure now. So it's not a stack of paper. 100%, no one almost gets any paper anymore. It's digital clicking up for disclosure. So now we have entered a, another layer of behavior mm -hmm. to the whether or not people read it. Your real estate agent is pushing all these e-clicks at you for dis various disclosures that you have to do. And we can take that as an opportunity to add technology to the e-click, as others have done in you know, your iPhone upgrade, <laughs> et cetera. You know, sometimes you have to actually scroll to the bottom before you're allowed to click. Um, maybe there's a visual that could be added to the disclosure form or change in the format that would make it more readable online. These are just some of the technical opportunities that are created in shifting from paper to digital. Um, this, the single most important thing is uh, to get the timing, the attention on the information at the moment when there's an opportunity to do something about it. But what I found as a home purchaser is every house I looked at had these flaws. 
And that made it impossible for me to use this as a criteria in which home to buy. Mm. I had to sort of imagine, did the difference in costs of remedying these things, right. how much did they differ right. between the homes that I was comparing? But, so, but Cheryl, what about the opportunity to um, debate, not debate, but to include that $5,000 retrofit in the, the negotiation for price? I know when it's not now a... Now that's where Fred's comment about yeah. buyer leverage yeah. matters. Yeah. You cannot do that. Yeah, because like it's we all... Had to, we had to offer a cash offer oh, in order to get yeah. you know, our bid yeah. accepted. So you, that's where the buyer lack of leverage really plays in. So it's going to be on us. So we know that perception from social science, the perception comes from change. So you can't see anything unless it's different, unless there's difference around it. So the tool I wanted while home shopping was that comparison of what would a retrofit be costing on this house compared to a retrofit on that house. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference that would have helped me see you know, does, does it, a doubling of the retrofit cost in this house really change the financial equation and safety compared to this other house? But even in that scenario, you're not always looking at two houses at exactly the same time. You make your offer one yeah, house one at a time. time. So I think it really exploring that decision scenario realistically from a home buyer perspective um, could hold some interesting opportunities for us and ways to talk to real estate agents about where in their dialogue with a, with a buyer are the real opportunities there. Um, the use case, this is my final topic um, coming back to how Kurt presented your information. Uh, that is something beautiful that, a, that is a process and a mentality that the information technology and communications world can bring to ours. And that is, it, we, start, we have to start with the use case. Who is using it when? And IT is used to doing that. That's how they sit down to start their idea of developing a product. And we don't really do that in engineering traditionally or in design. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really important shift and CEA's really been leading the edge on that through the comms department and thinking about it in a use case mm -hmm. framework. Um, that helps us think about not just tools, but the campaigns right. in which we embed those tools in order to get the tools in front of the most eyes and make it the most influential tool possible. Yeah. Or as I say, we, we've created the supply, but there's no demand yet. Well, yeah, I think there's untapped demand. <laughs> there you go. And demand um, yet to be cultivated. And, and it's never going to be 100% of the homeowner audience. That should not really be our goal. There's more like 30 or 40 percent of homeowners who are really in the benefit sweet spot. 20 percent of those know it and can't figure out how to do it, and 20 percent of those don't know it and need to be educated. So people move up through um, awareness to intention to acting, and uh, we have to market differently to each of those phases. Lots of thoughts, could go on forever, but I really uh, appreciate the dialogue and look forward to hearing what others have to say. Okay, Grace. Hi, thank you very much for a very, um, very interesting panel. Um, I really like the diversity of, uh, of perspectives that are brought um, to, the, to the morning. And I have, um, just as a, another sense of perspective, it's been 25 years since I've bought a home. Uh, but when I did buy my home in Berkeley, um, there was an incentive program that the city had for energy savings as well as um, earthquake retrofitting. <laughs> and what they did was they held back some of the transfer tax and we were able to pull into those funds for both insulating the roof of our home as well as putting plywood on our cripple walls. 
So I don't know if I can take advantage of the EBV program, but, <laughs> um, but that's what we did. So I'm wondering, I don't know what happened to that program, how it was funded, but there was a mechanism in place uh, where a municipality had, uh, you know, they created a marketplace, they created a mechanism so that homeowners' awareness of these two items would be heightened. Uh, so that's one item. The other is, Evan, you mentioned that the um, 2017 homeowners' inspection uh, requirements had changed. And I'm curious to know what the process of that was and if there's information from that process that we could learn from in uh, creating that awareness for retrofit for seismic risk to homeowners and to the overlying risk of a region, you know, of a municipality or of a county area. Um, so those are just two items that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, how can we increase the demand from the ground up uh, and, and use the tools and the resources we have with homeowners inspections and with the technology that we have to, to better create that marketplace for the demand of these items? Well, there's a little bit of background on that swimming pool uh, law. So. Um, a woman lost her son, her daughter, tragically, you know, to a swimming pool accident, almost lost her son. And so she started a nonprofit that was focused on, um, you know, safety around swimming pools for homes. And a couple of years ago, she, you know, she and her group introduced, a, you know, through, through a, a, a sympathetic, you know, assemblyman uh, or senator, a bill to require that when a home inspection is done, that it be checked for these different, you know, standard pool safety features, and that the home, a home, be retrofitted before it's sold to include at least two of these features. And that bill was uh, vetoed by the governor uh, in 2016, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, right? Yeah. And uh, so they reintroduced the bill in 2017, but were able to uh, essentially get the California Association of Realtors to take a neutral position by removing the retrofit requirement and just making it a disclosure requirement. So, you know, and they had a lot of people sign on to the bill uh, to support it. Um, a lot of it was very personal, obviously, for this woman, um, but it folded it into a process that was already established with trusted, you know, professionals like home inspectors. Uh, and the argument was simply, look, you know, this gives a, a buyer information that they wouldn't necessarily know on their own. And certainly earthquake safety for buildings. I mean, I don't expect your average homeowner to, to be able to know if the cripple wall is braced or something like that. Um, but a home inspector clearly can can do that kind of stuff. So it was just a matter of, of safety and uh, and that's how they got it passed. So you know that same kind of effort can be brought to bear, I think, you know, in our in our realm. I, I would uh, interject on that too that I was involved in the in the pool safety legislation. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, if if that moves forward with the uh, with the seismic stuff, I would urge you guys or whoever sponsors to involve the home inspectors up front because that actually didn't happen with the pool safety law and and there's some some very easily cured things that could have been done that would have made that law actually a lot more effective um, the way it's written is actually a, it's actually a very poorly written piece of legislation um, that that requires me as a home inspector to to test performance of those pool safety features in a way that's only possible to do in a laboratory mm. under under like uh, ASTM mm. standard uh, testing uh, criteria. So it's a it's a for for me that law as well intentions as it is is a is a, a liability nightmare. Um, Car was was very um, uh, strongly opposed to the legislation as it, as it was originally introduced because they don't want anything, frankly, that would be a barrier to completing a transaction and having to do a repair prior to that constitutes that in their mind. So um, involve the, the people up front in, in drafting. There's a, there's, a, there's a deck bill right now because of the Berkeley balcony collapse 
um, that, uh, that is pending right now that sort of suffers from the same problem. Um, the people sponsoring don't understand or didn't understand that they use some words that have very special meaning in the building codes. So there's some implications to the way that bill's written um, that are unintended, even though the, 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 uh, the fa at face value, it's very well intentioned, but it has some, it has some consequences because they chose a couple of words that were, like they use the word special inspection. In, in the building code, yeah. that has a very particular meaning. Uh, there is no special inspector to do what they're requiring to be specially inspected. They could, have, they could have chosen a different word and allowed a jurisdictional inspector to do that as opposed to some certified third party that doesn't exist. Uh, so, so involve the people that actually have to be the, the ones implementing would be my, my suggestion. Mm -hmm. All right, one last comment from Thor and then we'll, we'll break. Okay. No. Okay. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, for, for those of you who are too shy to comment, um, there's a notepad and, and pen on your table. You know, write your comments down on that or email them to Mary Ann, and she will be compiling all this, and I'm sure there, there are plenty of, of, of good thoughts. Um, I would like to very much uh, thank our, 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 our panel, uh, Evan, Skip, Janiel, and, and Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, um, And I just remembered, I don't even think I said um, John Ostra, so I, oh. <laughs> I apologize. I, I just assume everybody knows I want to thank you, John. John is, is working with us on many of our projects and provides so much consistency and, um, and great coordination, so thank you. So we're going to take a break until 1030.